Hi everyone and welcome to the Greensboro Public Library and the Kathleen Clay Edwards Family Branch. Tonight we are honored to have for the book release of U of 26 Charlie, P.T. Duderman in the house. Everyone give him a big round of applause. We want to thank St. Martin's Press uh, with, for, for having him have his book launch here at the Greensboro Public Library. Here at the Greensboro Public Library, we believe in the Anaconda went to destiny. There are so many resources online and at your library branch, and it's here for everyone to use. So please visit us at www.greensborolibrary.org. Now it's my pleasure to, to hand the microphone over to Mr. Duderman, who is going to take questions from our audience. Thank you very much. The question uh, that we were just discussing before you joined was, was the Iwo Jima invasion operation worth the cost? It's a very small island. It is the tip top of a volcano that goes 6,000 feet down under the water. And in fact, is erupting now as we speak. Another vent has opened and is building another erosion. Right? It is a barren, God forsaken place. About two miles wide, about five and a half, six miles long with a volcanic hill, or what they call it a mountain, but it's not really, about 600 feet high, at one end. And in 1945, the United States was preparing for the invasion of Japan, which was expected to happen in 1946, early spring. And the people in Washington who were estimating what that would take to accomplish, we're getting a little antsy. The Japanese have made it clear that they had a population at that time between 58 and 60 million people, and that every one of them would be given a weapon and be on the beach when the Americans got there. 58 million determined, suicidal, fanatic, brave, evil, mean, scary. All the adjectives you want, Japanese, men, women, and children. The estimated casualties on the American side, this is the best guess they had in Washington of what it would take to take Japan in a million people. Normandy did not have a million casualties. And Normandy was bad enough. And therefore, the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, well, let's take Iwo Jima because Iwo Jima gives the Japanese home defense system early morning when the B-29s come out of Tinian in Guam. And it gives the Japanese one hour's notice. Here they come. And it, um, it made sense in one way. It did not make sense in the other. But what we did not expect was that the Japanese had had two years to prepare the island. They knew they could not defeat the American forces that were coming. They knew that none of them would live through the experience, and that suited them just fine. They prepared the island. It's tip top of a volcano, not hard to go digging in. And the soil that when you go digging in it is warm. It is an active volcano. And they have been miles and miles of tunnels, caves, prepared positions, gun emplacements. And Mount Suribashi, which is the tip top of the volcano on one end of the island, honeycombed. Honeycombed. There are 5,000 people there on the patient day in the volcano. Inside, the temperature is about 105 degrees. There is no fresh water on the island. The people who had lived there, and they were giving me salt for it, had mined salt. And all, all their water came from rain. All the food came from the sea. They 
from the raw rice. Couldn't believe it is barren. Never seen the slopes of Mount Edna, Mount Vesuvius, Mount St. Helens, and nothing there. Absolutely nothing there. The Japanese prepared their replacements and they prepared a different kind of reaction to an invasion. All the previous island invasions, here came the Americans, the Japanese would open fire on instantaneously. They'd shoot at all the boats that were coming in, they'd shoot the ships that were out there doing pre-landing bombardment, they shoot down the airplanes. It was a fight daybreak when the Americans got there, not on Timo G. The island was silent. And here came three, two Marine Divisions. The 3rd Marine Division was held in reserve. I didn't think it could be needed. It was a little bit the island. No generals. No, no cover for anybody. Unless they were underground. <laughs> they let the American forces land on the landing beaches. Now, the topography and the nature of these beaches were they were not sand. They were black, and they looked like black sand, but they were made of volcanic ash and pumice with a dose of sulfuric acid because of all of the, every time it rain, it turns some of this stuff into sulfuric acid. Marines hit the beach, they sank up to their knees. They couldn't move. If they tried to move, it was like quicksand. And the Marines sent 30, 40,000 people on the beaches. They didn't look, they looked like a piece of cake. Get on the beach, get over the hump of the beach, get in land as quickly as possible. They couldn't move. Tanks could not move. Amtraks, the, the boats with tracks on them, which were supposed to hit the beach and charge with the beach and get into the trees. There were no trees. There was no cover. Right inside of where they landed was an airfield covering. No cover. The Japanese did nothing. And that was scary. The Americans were all shore with battleships, cruisers, destroyers, firing away, tearing the place up. Except they were 16 inch shell lands in 80 feet of pumice. It goes off as a crater, which fills itself in. It didn't do anything. The Americans had been bombing Iwo Jima for about six months. And he'd be 29 flying over, coming back from Japan with some bombs, would divert to Iwo Jima. In case they go underground. Well, like, yeah, they had. But they'd gone way underground. And they had figured it out. You can bomb it all you want. You're not going to damage anything. The damage the airfield, that's concrete. The big shells will go off from the earth and we'll pull them in the next day. As we did it all the night, the Japanese battleships came up with them one night and destroyed, absolutely destroyed hundreds of people, which was an operation by four o'clock the next day. Bombing airfields, you know, there's a way around that. Bombing sand. It really is. You've got to get some bulldozers up there. And it wasn't until they put lanes on tanks at one end of the landing beaches, and there were bulldozers, that the Marines were able to get off the beach, having already lost 10, 12,000 people. Because what the Japanese did is once they had a target rich environment, as they say now, two Marine divisions started. On a 50 foot wide beach, the sea on one side, and a ridge of sand on the other, and you had to move every gun. Every gun on the wall was up. Up to that point, there had been no return fire. And this was the Japanese plan. They will find them when they're coming in and fighting for here, and they're stuck here. So that's what happened. And the original question was, was taking the Union because the Marines had 
three individuals were at this one of the stories. So many casualties, so many dead, so many wounded, so many people with a blank stare in their eyes that if you sneezed, would die from cover. You know, the method of cover. We know about it now. We know, you know, the, the stress syndrome, the battle stress syndrome, PTSD. We know about it. And guys would, would stand up in shock and horror. They get shot last night. And they had practiced this. So it turned me into a meat grinder for the Marine Corps. These three divisions had been scheduled to participate in the invasion of Okinawa, which was the next one that was planned. They could. They could not. They couldn't function as a division. They'd lost their sergeants, they'd lost their second lieutenants, they'd lost their majors and their colonels. You know, the, the, the nerves and the leaders, the grunts expect to leave, are gone from them. It was a catastrophe. And in retrospect, the question is was it really worth losing that many Marines? Three Marine divisions to take this little bitty, nothing little guy. Well, they said the B 29s that get damaged over Japan can land here. We won't lose them. And they claimed that, you know, 2,600 B 29 crews were saved because they could land on Iwo Jima after Iwo Jima was taken. You read the official Air Force records, that number. Is in doubt. It really is. And it does not come close to even the number of people, American people, who died on the team. It did wake up the Joint Chiefs of Staff as to how tough the next one would be, Okinawa. It was worse. It was much worse. The Japanese did the same thing. They let them set up their armors. They let them set up their bases. They let them get 20 miles in ram into the free recording artillery matrix of a thousand big guns. And they said, now, now we'll die. And this gave credence to the claims that if you go to Japan itself, it's going to be a million capital casualties. We didn't have a million if we put a show up. In Japan, not after he won't, not after Okinawa. Which led to, and I've just finished a book about this, Mr. Truman's decision to go ahead with the atomic bomb. Maybe we will not have to invade Japan. Let's see if we can convince them to surrender. Because the Japanese perspective on evil and Okinawa. Maybe we can convince the Americans not to come. And they were very realistic about it. We're going to lose evil, we're going to lose Okinawa, we're going to lose any island or route the main islands of Japan. We know this. We can't beat them. But maybe they won't want to come. And I'm telling you, the people in those three Marine divisions are not going to come. It's just that the way this is slaughtered. And that's how it turned out. This book is the story of a, a kid, a young lieutenant all about you, and how safe can you be in World War II to be a young lieutenant all about you. You can't be any safer than that. Not only that, he was down below in the bench, in the gunnery control center, shooting these huge 15 inch guns five decks down. It was all fire, boom, fire again, boom. You know, and, and, and he felt a little guilty about being so safe, so protected, when all these 18 and 19 year olds on the shore on the Iwo Jima as the reports came back. He went over and they didn't come back, but they weren't going to go back. The ones that came back, came back, came back. He says, the Japanese sniper. 
patrols, hunted down the Marine Corps' fire control teams when the other battleship offshore shooting in support of troops onshore. You have a guy in a tree who calls the battleship and says, here's your target. Shoot. And the battleship shoots him over here. So he sends back corrections to the battleship at 1,000 yards, right 1,000 yards, down 50 feet. The battleship shoots again, though. Down 50 yards. You know, and they send this train of reports back until the battleship's grounds are landing on the enemy. And then he says, now, give me 10 rounds of 15 inch projectiles. Round a continuous fire, go on. And they speak in code. But they, they, it's not a printed code, it's a code, procedural code. And they have to go to school to learn to speak this code. And it's called talking. And if they get a, a new spotter that lands on the island to replace all the ones that have been hunted down and killed by these Japanese sniper teams, so they don't have anybody to correct the whole shot. First thing you ask, can you talk? It sounds silly, can you talk? But you have to know how to talk between the ships and the guys ashore in the trees, or you can't get the job done. This lieutenant volunteers because he knows how to talk. He talks to spotters and finds out all the people he's been talking to are dead. He volunteers to go ashore onto the island and become a spotter. And the first Marine he meets looks at him and says, You did what? <laughs> you know what they say in the Army, never volunteer. So he's taken under the way of three characters. And this is probably what makes the book really interesting. Three Marine Corps characters. And the Marine Corps has a guy that they call a character. He is a character. He is a very narrow. He's precious because the, the young prince can relate to them. And that's what happens. This book tells you his experience becoming a spotter under the way of three Marine Corps characters known as the Moon Squad. And that's because of the head sergeant of the Moon Squad three guys. His name is Moon. You got a Moon, but that's what they call And you're going to go through the battle of Rio Chima, and you're going to have to put this book down every time it's out. Because I'm going to describe it in gross detail what the kids ran into, what happened to the Japanese, what happened to the Americans, what it was like at night to have three Marines in a, in a box hole. And a box hole in sand is a tough thing to accomplish. You dig it out, you have to wrap it in. The Japanese would send teams out at night, two to three guys, no guns. They carried no guns, they carried swords. They carried swords. And they slunk through the sand, stood up in front of the box hole with these three guys, two sleeping, one watching. At first, and later it became two watching ones. Screaming bonfires, screaming on the Japanese, and swimming swords. Now they're going to talk. Yes? How did you research this book? I read eyewitness accounts from people who were there. How did I research the book? Uh, first of all, being a novel, I thought I knew what happened. I thought this would be an easy one to write. And then I read some books written by guys who were there and realized I didn't know anything. I really did not know anything. So I studied in the Naval Historical Center. Uh, this battle is well documented. It is fought over and over at the Green Corps Training Center as, an example, as examples of infantry leadership, examples of logistics when there's no water. Water had to come in from the ships in barrels. Barrels had to be hung by people at the front line. With a five gallon drum of water. Far bigger than that. Well, being shot. Like that. And so 
So I've got one more detail that I, that I never wanted to have some bad friends of Sinai's because it was grotesque. The Japanese that were killed were not buried. The ground was warm. They decomposed rapidly. To move anywhere on the evil, they were trampling over the enclosing bodies. The air was not breathable. And sulfur fumes are rising out of the sand as it's the top of the damn volcano. Horror. I had to cut it back, actually. Or you, or you just you just want to finish it. But there's enough in there where you really get the picture. You really want to get the picture. Now why, when people looked at Okinawa and they did it again, there began to be big doubts about it in Japan. We had not enough people to sacrifice to invade Japan, as it turned out. But that's a, that's a general research. And I do that for all of my books. Yes? How do you select? How do you select the battle that you want to spin a yard out? One that I haven't already done. I've done 27 of these things, so I'm running that up. But this was more important. Most of my other stuff was the was, uh, Navy. And I had to learn about the Marine Corps, too. That is a very special group of people. They have their own societal rules. If you screw up in the Marine Corps, you'll get a disciplinary cut. Uh, and you talk about the Marines, you say, well, oh, you may not, but you will be disciplined in some way that hurts you. You may not be court. You're not going to jail. But if you screw up and you do better, you almost sustain a disciplinary. Which makes it a pretty tight out. There was a guy named John Basil who got the Medal of Honor in Guadalcanal. When he got the Medal of Honor, he was sent back to the States to help sell war bonds. That's what happened if you got a real hero. Basil was her real hero. Sorry. He did that for about six months and then requested to go back to his outfit. He missed them. His outfit went to him. And something between that. But he said, I let my I let my my battalion down, I let my squads down, I let my platoon down. I'm not there. They are there. He could have stayed home. And he stayed on the end for time for about two or three months. And then he said, you know, it's, it's time. And he was killed on the end. Of course. Yeah. That's a question. People like that. I ask that sometimes. Yes. Uh, so not about this, but uh, at the same time, there was a lot of napalm being used to bomb a lot of Japanese cities. Would you talk about that and um, how, what kind of influence that might have had? The question is about napalm. Uh, napalm is, is an infantry level weapon. What they did, what uh, Curtis LeMay of the Army Air Force did, was they firebombed the city to Cape Tokyo with the B-29s. Somebody reminded them that Japanese houses are made of wood and paper. So, how about a fire store? And what they did in October of 44, I think, they sent 600 B-29s over Tokyo at relatively low level. The first 100 dropped Blow stuff up. The other 500 dropped incendiary bombs. And these were bombs, big 500 pounders, which carried small incendiary bombs. Not the size of a flashlight, but was a good analogy. Two or three feet long, filled with uh, magnesium and an oxidizer. And they flew over Tokyo. And they set the entire city on fire. 89,000 confirmed dead in one night. 
And Tokyo was a city that had a downtown, had the Imperial Palace. The rest of it was made out of wood and paper. You've seen pictures of them. They're very pretty. And the reason for that was the earthquakes. You know, a wooden and paper house fell down on you, you can fall out from under it. This entire city was serviced by a network of canals. And when the entire city caught fire, it was called a firestorm. There was one in, in Europe that was just about as bad. All the air is sucked out of the ground and goes up. Even if you're not in the fire, you can't breathe. There's no air. So what everybody did was they jumped in the canals. Because there's a little layer of air right above the water. Now these are they call them ventro ditches, these are sewage canals, trash canals. Yeah. But the city was crisscrossed, so dive in the canal, they won't burn to death. No, you won't burn to death. You will walk to death. They won't walk. This is this is tough stuff. And Tokyo was not effective as a city until the Americans came back. In 1945, after the surrender, the Japanese had dispersed a lot of their industry and aircraft gun industry, airplane engine plants. That, as much as you could disperse that out into the neighborhoods. So your neighborhood might be working on uh, cylinder liners or an airplane engine. And they'd go by and get in a boat and run it down the canal to the airplane factory. Well, we bombed the airplane factory. Well, we could say that the armament industry was present in suburbia of Tokyo, and therefore it was okay if we bombed the civilian area of Tokyo. Well, what did we? <coughs> it, it was a horror. They did it a couple times. But the rain in October uh, was just gone off. People who went on the raid asked not to do that again because it was obvious you couldn't see Tokyo with all the lights were out until you set it on fire. Then you could see it was a big city. You could see the crisscross grid where the houses were. They were only at five, six thousand feet. How many shooting in them? No air. They couldn't breathe. They couldn't fire. The main, <laughs> the butcher of Tokyo. Your question. But one thing, these were bombs designed to do just that. Yes, sir. Six months. It takes me six months to write it. It might take me six to eight months to research it. But once I get going, if it's taking longer, it's going to be a slow read. And it will look like a slow read. You get into my stuff, it goes back. The only bad part about it is you start at 10 o'clock at night and you've got to work tomorrow morning and you look up at the clock and it's 2.30 and I've got a chat. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've got a computer, of course, and uh, I'm pretty fast on the computer. I know how the story begins, how it was fought, and how it's going to end. And I work uh, three, four hours a day and then I don't know the form. And then my wife is. Oh, we just fall off the track or something. I lost sight of something else. The story never leaves. And I'm writing the story if I'm on a tractor and going 10 acres of grass. The story is cranking, cranking, cranking. It never leaves. So in six months I've been written. And then I go on to the next one while the book goes into production. Production takes eight months. It takes them longer. To produce the book, it takes me to write it. Writing is the easy part, really. And when COVID came along, we all learned a big lesson we in the publishing industry. There were three printers in the United States of America who could produce a hardback. Hardbacks are assembled, not by hand anymore, but they are there. And COVID took out two of them. People got sick, they closed. And it went down. 
There's one printer in the United States of America who can print hardbacks. I turned in a book in October of 2022. Uh, this one. This one is sad, sad, sad. And then, and then, they were shortages in the supply chain where their paper for a hard bag is not like printer paper. Blue to put the books together. Couldn't get it. Printers ink. Couldn't get it. Amazing. They said, well, we'll bring this out a year from now. And I called the editors and we said, hell, I'm, you know, I'm going to book here. And I did my job. And they said, well, sorry. There's no printer. So, but yeah, it's, it's six months. Yeah. So how does the audible part start? Okay. Question was, how does the audible part start? I don't read. I don't have a voice for it. And there are professional actors. Some of whose names you recognize who read books for audible books. It's a separate contract, it's a separate sale. The publisher holds an auction. And once you're an established author, you'll get a bunch of the audible companies who will come to you and say, Okay, I'll give you 5000 for this one, I'll give you the same thing. You have an auction. And uh, that company produces the book and tries to bring it out as an audible book. Same time that the book comes out, and I share the proceeds from with that with the publisher 50 50. That's how it works. Ebooks, the publisher produces. I mean, I've, I've given them an electronic manuscript to begin with, they'll format it and just print out. Or the translations, my agent. A lot of my books have been published, books have been published in Japan. That's stopped for this one. But somebody has to translate it. Japanese sub agent will buy it, I'll get an income stream from it, and they produce it in Japanese or Spanish or French or German or whatever. The market is worldwide. Yeah. Oh, no, it's too many. But uh, you had other books that were not uh, based on battles in the war, and I enjoyed those as well. And I'm just wondering if, if those are you're not going to do those anymore, or they just sort of evolved into doing these researches. That yeah, they the question is, my first series of books, other than the first two, were not navy oriented at all. I was writing thrillers, following the market. And that's what authors do who are not literary authors, who are not stylists. It's not, I'm writing general fiction. Um, and the market shifted. They only want to read thrillers anymore. They wanted to read techno thrillers. Who was the guy that was the insurance villain? Hunt for Red October? Please. Yeah. Um, in millions because he created that genre and then everybody jumped in and I finally I couldn't compete too small so I said well I'll do something I know I think it and off we went and then that became my niche people now are writing public fiction books about current military history Afghanistan and Middle East and stuff I don't know anything about that, I wasn't there. But, and I wasn't in World War II either, but my father was, my uncle was. I studied it for years in the war college and in other schools. And, and the funny part was, every time I thought, well, I don't know what happened there, I'll just write about it. I came back and found out, well, actually, you know. But there are sources for it, second of all, personal experiences, biographies. Autobiographies, the name of the historical center, Google. I thank Google and all my books. I'm on it all the time, all the time. And it's, it's, it's just amazing. You say, well, you have to go into a book and find out about this battle, this time, this week, this ship, 
And there'll be a million articles on it. Pick a couple. And they, and they contradict each other. Okay, now we got the you know, second level historical center. Maybe logs, biographies of people, or autobiographies of people who were there. But as a lead, you'll go to what two ships were the, the second double dog in this side. One was mine. It was the other one. I remember it was the back, it was the back. No, I don't. Google it. It's the RSS. That's an interesting night. And there was that way there. Your information. Yeah. Originalist history saying that incident and he gave the suspect. It wasn't suspect. It was real enough for them to know what was there. And what we saw on the radio were six contacts coming straight at us from about 10 miles out in formation, a line of dashes, clear as a bell. And if you've ever looked at a military radar, there are good paints, skin paint. Skin paint means you're getting a reflection off the metal. And these were skin paints. These were perfect, perfect formation. 29 knots. I mean, goodness. We had two destroyers. We were going 32 and 33 knots. 500 yards distance. Firing everything we had. We had I mean, it was, it was a bad gentleman. There was so much noise and fire and the shells. Except we could see where the shells were landing, which were all over these contacts. And they kept on. And there was just nobody in hell. The Katie could have survived. 25 inch 54 is there for 23 inch 50 shooter. The 5 inch 54 is to put out 42 pounds a minute. You know, I mean, it made no sense. And then we got a report from down in Bay Battery Plant that the fire control radar guys were saying, we can see all of our shells flashes. We can't actually see the targets. I can see them. I was the guy at CFC on the scope. Designating these targets to the, to the control down there. They were actually shooting at my designation, which puts a little bit on their radar. Well, if that's it, it was say so. You know, it's 17,000 yards, very 336, over 29 minutes, two. Later on, this was 1964, right? I think so. Later on, I was in the Tonkin Gulf on the USS Jewett, which was in this one. And the first night we got up there in Tonkin Gulf, 9, 10, 10, 30, 9, on, on, general parking. Here came those six same contacts. Straight line, 9, 10 miles out, 130 knots. Pointing right at us. And we were fixing the shit up. And I put my hand up and I said, hang on, let's see if the fire control radar can see it. Because these are banners. Now the captain of the ship had seen them before too. He said, yeah, you're right, those are banners. It's too good, it's too good. Straight at us, not in lines. And no, the guys from the fire were precise radars. With, with a radar beam size diameter of half a pencil then. This is precision radar. Ain't nothing there was. We let them come in and disappear. Oh, just so, and then, and then, and then, you know, and the things they had never seen anything. He was, he was scared to death. Why are we shooting? Yes, ma'am. How did you get the inspiration for your book, Evil Twenty Six Charles? The title. You were an inspiration for the book itself, the story. How did I get the story of it? Was there any inspiration for it? No, no, just how it's done. He 
Rule 26 Charlie is something I made up. I go on something. But if you're in a Navy ship and you're dealing with infantry ashore and you are in the support mode, they get in trouble, they call you on the radio, and their last name is always 26 Charlie. It might be Butternut 26 Charlie, Landon, Smith 26 Charlie. That doesn't matter, but if it has the ending 26 Charlie, it's a green. Or an army spotter talking to the Navy, talking, remember I talked about the code. 2 6 Charlie means this guy is an active spotter and he needs help. And so, with this, with this lieutenant ashore, he didn't have a name. So he made one up. He said, You will. I mean, you will. 2 6 Charlie. Because he worked the whole time and survived the night. And became quite famous, of course, in the book because he had a battleship. In his hands. <laughs> so instead of calling in the destroyer to do a job of work on a Japanese button, he could call in the end of the world, the beast. And so everybody wanted to be able to say, Charlie, working for. I had a question. Yes. So we talked a little bit about the Navy kind of being the Navy as a whole, as you were writing, you thought you do you ever find yourself uh, like purposely writing to highlight those sorts of like the horrible experiences that those people went through, or do you just say, oh, this is something I know about and find interesting I want writing? The, the, the question is write about the blood the horror of land combat or sea combat. At least in land, you can retire and you can withdraw. Battleships get started to build out the door to go. Who's going to win? Who's going to die? And what happens inside the ship is very similar to what happens on the shore. Plus, there's nowhere to go. You're locked into steel compartments. If a 15 inch shell joins you in that compartment, it was gone. Uh, it, it's a vain job. But no, I do not overdo the blood and the guts and the heart. I don't know where. Basically, I was like, stuff I thought I knew about and didn't know. And there were a couple scenes which I changed to shorten that out because it's going on, on, on. You can not skip there. Uh, but, but no, uh, you don't need to. Just reporting what happened was enough. Uh, and if you read it, you'll know, see what I mean. Yes. My favorite book of all time. Wow, that's hard. I've read, I've been reading since I was, you know, seven, eight years old. One of the ones, it's called The Last Temptation of Christ, written by a guy named Nicholas Kosozakis. And it is the story of Christ's time with the with the devil, where the devil tries to open it. And it's much more than that. Much, much more than that. But it is really cause for thought. Really cause for thought. Um, there's too many. I don't have any paper. There's thousands of books. Literally. Yes? Any questions there? One more. Okay. Um, as an established author with a large body of how do you feel the ebook portion of the distribution of literature has affected your profession? I I treated well, the question was how my ebooks have then they become a competition to real books. <laughs> yeah, well, but basically how has it affected you? Uh, it has increased my market. Increased my market a lot. I don't buy books through the library. I don't buy hardbacks. Uh, well, I buy some. They're very, very special to me. But uh, e-books are great. Audible books. We don't go on a trip anywhere without at least three e-books. Or all our audible books are stacked up. It's great. You're locked in a car and you get the book. You get to listen to it. Turn it off and just put your sleep. Um, and it's the same way. Somebody once asked me, How do you feel about other authors? 
and you're doing better than you are. More than are is how I feel. More offers, more books. I think you know, I don't feel this competition. I can do what I can do in this moment. Yes? Why don't you tell them for those who want to start writing a book, what it is you usually tell them as to how they Oh, yeah. The question was, the people that are asking you, how do you start the writing book? They're just, they're just you. And you think you can write a book. Somebody says, do you think you can write a book? Really? And typically, a lot of people who would like to try to tell a story. Stop right there. What happens when you first sit down in front of the computer? There's that cursor. Like, 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 you there? Are we going to do something? Uh, yeah. In the beginning, it was one of the, you know, it takes a certain Kutzpah, I think is the term we call it, to start. You think, yeah, I can write a book. Okay? Don't do it. I've got this great story, I don't know. I'm going to start. Oh, uh, you know, in many occasions, people just fail. They don't know how to They don't think they should have been. There's no way. It takes them. And this is what I tell you. If you really have a good story, okay, you got a couple buddies that you know who's going to go to bar and go to their beer. And what do you do? Well, you tell stories, you tell lies about fishing and hunting, tell what happened last week, what happened this week. You have no problem doing that. No, it's just tell a story. Okay? If you've got a story, Go out and buy a cup of voice activated tape recorders. The one in your pocket, the one in the drawer, if you're going to need it. You take your at the bar with your two best friends. And let me tell you what happened to me last week. You wouldn't believe it. Go to it. Tell the story to you to the budgets. I can hear it if you need it. Tell the story. And as you do, telling your friends a story, just animate your voice. Because you do, you know, as you know, she said, let's see what, oh, you have accents. I can hardly understand this. So you give your, your version of, of a southern accent. Tell the story, just tell it. But you know that your story is done in the type of course. Down to the county courthouse and ask for the court reporters. The court reporter does this for me. We'll listen to your tape recorder and we'll produce what's known as a, wait for it, a manuscript. You did it. You wrote a book. You wrote a story. You wrote a chapter. Whatever it is. And the little cursor there is now very supposed to type it, no, no, no. I can't type. I can't type right and think great at the same time. I can tell the whole story. I just need your own life and your words. I've had people produce books from the back of these. That's what I did. And after the first one I've come down, just tell the story. There's two rules in publishing about getting started. First, write the book. You may have the best idea of the Nobel Prize in your head. The best, the most amazing story. Publisher, agents are there. Give me the manuscript. He can tell in three pages whether you can write or more importantly, he can sell the book. First, write the book. Second, get an agent. Publishers used to have this thing called the slushy file, where authors would toss manuscripts. Over the trees at the publishing house, they would pile up inside the front door. And the junior editor who had managed to irritate the senior would decide that night to go through the select part. Is there anything there? No. Is it there? No. Is that more I found? Actually, I found 
and this was both the mind and the people of the book. All this is today will not be a new thing unless you're one of their authors. You can't be a new guy to get to talk to them. They will only deal with the nation and only deal with the nation who they've dealt with before. So you gotta get a nation. You just gotta get a nation. We can work the first class having written the book. Probably hire somebody to write it for you or type it for you. And people do that. There's a, there's a bad new publishers out there. They'll take anything. You pay them to produce a book. It's going to be a bad book. And good luck. But in terms of getting into the mainstream and publishing the markets and, and book reading audiences, and most importantly, my purpose. Most of my sales are in libraries. Most. How's that for a That was a great segue into our event on January 27th with Jill McCorkle. She will be in conversation with her editor from Algonquin Books. And in Author Day, we invite regional authors to come and have a table on that Saturday, and it will be in the lobby. And we'll also invite our book clubs to come and talk about their favorite books of 2023 and what they want to read in 2024. But it will be an interesting conversation with Jill McCorkle and her editor from Algonquin, Kathy Quarries, about the whole editor-author relationship. And I would say that too, especially for self-published authors or hybrid published authors, editing is so important when you're trying to get your story. And so either hire an editor or, like um, Mr. Dubin said, get an agent and go through the editing process. It's really important to have a good story. Always have a good story. We love a good story here at Greensboro Public Library.